Many years ago, when my husband and I toured the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., as we walked around, following the artwork from medieval times into the Renaissance, we were both stunned when we came across a certain piece of art. Up to that point, the paintings, although beautiful and intriguing, had a very primitive feel about them. And then we saw this one. It was dynamic. It looked like it could have been painted yesterday. And it was incredibly realistic. It was unlike any of the prior pieces we'd seen. This was the museum's sole painting by Jan van Eyck, and we were totally taken in. What made his work so different? And what process did he use to achieve such remarkable results? In this series, we're going to take a look at the painting processes of some of the most famous oil painters, and we'll break down their methods into understandable steps. As we examine their methods, it's important to keep in mind that most of them adjusted their painting processes according to the subject in the composition being painted. Also, they would often change their methods as they aged, experimenting along the way. For this reason, I've selected what I feel was their most significant method, and one that would provide viewers with a well-rounded perspective. We'll begin by taking a closer look at Jan van Eyck, an artist who's often considered the father of oil painting and the first oil painting master. Jan van Eyck was a Flemish artist who lived and worked in Bruges in the early 1400s. He was a highly successful artist who, in addition to painting for the Duke of Burgundy, also occasionally functioned as his diplomat. But of course, he's best known for his painting and most specifically for the Arnolfini portrait and the Ghent altarpiece, which he painted with his older brother Hubert. For approximately 200 years after his death, it was generally thought that Jan van Eyck invented oil painting. But actually, scientists have found cave paintings in Afghanistan that date back to the 7th century, painted using drying oil and pigment. And oil painting was mentioned by a German monk in 1100 AD. What Jan and his older brother Hubert did do was perfect its use. He was one of the first artists to develop a formal working process of layering glazes with oil paint in order to build up form and depth of color. A glaze is simply a transparent layer of paint. This concept was likely developed as a result of his work with egg tempera, the common painting medium of his day. Van Eyck is believed to have worked in egg tempera early in his career, painting manuscript illustrations. Egg tempera is a medium that requires the slow buildup of glazed color, so you can see why artists at that time would naturally attempt to apply oil paint in the same way. The trick was how to properly mix and lay down this new form of paint. In Van Eyck's time, the first thing an artist would do is seal the surface with a layer of what's called sizing. At that time, it was a form of animal glue. Then they would establish the ground. A ground is basically a special coating that allows the surface to safely accept the paint. This coating consisted of gesso, a type of absorbent plaster made up of animal glue, chalk or gypsum, and white pigment. Over the dried ground, Van Eyck would then create an intensely detailed underdrawing using a brush and thinned black paint. His level of detail, both in his sketches and in the final work, is one of the many things that makes his work stand out, both then and now. Van Eyck would then seal his drawing onto the surface with a thin layer of tinted oil primer, tinted to soften the painted edges. Oil primer was basically the same thing as a ground, only using drying oil instead of the animal glue. Next, Van Eyck would paint a single color version of his painting, called a grisaille. A grisaille was intended, in a sense, to mimic the look of a sculpture, and in Van Eyck's case, was painted in gray tones. It was basically a monochromatic value painting, and would later serve as the lights and darks in his painting. 
Over this, he would paint a layer of thinned, medium-toned, opaque paint, the base colors, and they were thin enough to appear translucent, meaning they would allow some of the values in the monochromatic layer to show through. At this point, his painting would consist of the base layer with the light, medium, and dark values in his forms. What he needed to do now was establish the true colors. To do this, he would apply layer upon layer of transparent glazes. These glazes also helped him build up the forms. He is said to have used pure color, something also likely carried over from his work in egg tempera. Each additional glaze of pure color would make the resulting color more vibrant. To increase transparency and improve drying time, he was also known to use colorless ground glass in some of his paints, a practice that was actually fairly common throughout the 14 and 1500s. In fact, Raphael and Catherine Van Hemmesen both used it in some of their paint mixes. Van Eyck added a little creativity to his approach by scraping into the wet paint for textural effect and blotting the wet glazes with his fingers or hands in order to adjust the paint. After completing all of the glazed layers and allowing the last one to dry, the final step was to apply opaque details. Van Eyck was actually one of the first artists to sign his paintings and sometimes he would include his personal motto, Greek text that reads, als ich kann, meaning as well as I can. Now, there are opinions on why he included a motto, something that was normally reserved for aristocrats in his day. I tend to think it shows a bit of humanity, that even someone as brilliant as Van Eyck knew he had limitations. One of the hallmarks of Van Eyck's work is the incredible, long-lasting brilliance of his colors. It's been several centuries now, and his paintings, as mentioned, still look like they could have been painted yesterday. Experts have tried to figure out how he achieved this. Could it be related to traces of protein that scientists have found in some of his paints? That could mean that he mixed in a touch of egg, animal glue, casein, or perhaps gelatin with his paints. We know he sometimes used egg tempera in his final layers of blue paint. This was both to save money and to increase brilliance. But did he also mix it into other areas of his work? Or could his paint stability be due to the addition of pine resin, which we know he used on occasion? But since many artists after his era used similar resins without the same results, I tend to think that would not be the secret ingredient. It's a bit of a mystery in the art world. Another mystery is how exactly Van Eyck's method for applying oil paint spread throughout Western Europe, and specifically to Italy, another hub of artistic development. The story is a bit controversial, as we'll see. Antonello de Messina is said to have been a student under Jan Van Eyck towards the end of Van Eyck's life. He may have been responsible for introducing oil painting, and more specifically Van Eyck's technique, to artists in Italy. Some experts believe that de Messina studied directly under him, and that once Van Eyck died, he returned to Italy and took up his own painting practice using Van Eyck's oil painting methods. As word got out about his brilliant colors and his lifelike paintings, the process spread and was part of the transition to oils in Italy. However, some experts believe de Messina never left Italy and either communicated with Van Eyck's leading student Petros Christos as a way of learning Van Eyck's oil painting method, or merely studied his work in a local art collection. Either way, he seems to have been a major influence in bringing Van Eyck's oil painting method to Italy where he was one of the first Italian masters to use that technique and possibly one of the first to introduce Italian artists to oil painting in general. A century later, another Italian master would push the boundaries of the oil painting process. 
He's best known by his abbreviated name, Titian. Titian is often considered one of the most important artists of the 16th century. He's one of those artists that took the process of oil painting to a new level, breaking with tradition by using vibrant color, conveying flowing figures in massive scale, and allowing his surfaces to have uneven thickness. He brought a new kind of freedom to painting, something that may not have been acceptable if not for his renowned skill and his international clientele. With Titian, we begin to see more texture on the surface, a change from the smooth surface that we saw with Van Eyck. Titian was trained under both Giovanni Bellini and Giorgione, both renowned artists at the time. Part of his early training was in fresco painting, something that experts feel was an influence on his eventual style, where he used broad brush handling for the landscape elements in his paintings. Titian was also one of the first professional artists to use canvas as a painting surface. Canvas was catching on in Venice as an option because of the humidity levels in the city. Being a coastal town, humidity levels were high, which could result in the warping of wood panels, still the popular painting surface at that time. Canvas material was readily available and affordably priced. This is because Venice was heavily involved in the shipping trade, and canvas is what they used for the masts on ships. Canvas, stretched onto wood supports, had more give, and was more convenient when painting large pieces or shipping a completed painting. Plus, the material could be carefully rolled if necessary. In addition to popularizing canvas, for a long time, experts thought Titian was one of the first masters to use a brown or a dark-toned ground. But with current technology, some now think he may have used a light ground, and that because he applied the ground so thinly, and without sizing, over time, the gesso browned with age. However, there are other experts who, using infrared and x-ray technology, believe he did use brown grounds for some of his work, including in his painting, A Boy with a Bird. Because it's debated, we'll proceed with evaluating his process, assuming he used a white or light ground. Now, like Van Eyck, Titian would establish his underdrawing by painting the composition with thinned black paint. Unlike Van Eyck, these were just basic contour lines, not intricate detail. Experts have found traces of grid lines on some of his paintings, which tells us that he may have worked out certain compositions in a preliminary sketch and then transferred the drawing to the painting surface using a grid method. But he was also known to draw his underdrawing freehand with very brief lines. And later in his career, he would simply work out the composition as he painted, no underdrawing at all. Also, unlike Van Eyck, Titian didn't seal his underdrawing or create a monochromatic base layer to establish the lights and dark values. Instead, he would do one of two things. He would either paint an imprimatura, typically an all-over thin layer of color, sometimes scrubbed onto the surface. For example, you can see what might be a hint of one here. Notice how the background color comes short of covering the area next to the fabric. Or he would paint a flat, simple version of the forms using opaque paint. This is often referred to as blocking in. At this point, according to Palma Giovanni, a young contemporary of Titian's, after completing the blocking in of his forms, Titian would turn his paintings towards the wall for weeks and sometimes months in order to have fresh eyes when he turned it around again. At that point, he'd make any adjustments and continue the painting process, occasionally using his hands to adjust the paint, much like Van Eyck did. He would then apply the familiar layers of glaze that we discussed with Van Eyck, 
in order to achieve color brilliance. Titian was known for being a supreme master of color, and areas of his paintings could have up to 40 layers of glaze, producing incredible vibrance. Unlike Van Eyck's method of painting one color at a time, Titian was known to pick up several colors at once with a single brush and then sweep them onto the surface. He went beyond the standard glazing methods, however. He was known to apply his paint to still wet areas of paint, known as wet in wet. He would use textured brushwork with brush lines still being visible. And he was even known to paint large areas of impasto paint. Impasto is simply the Italian term for thick paint. He was one of the first masters to incorporate impasto, especially in the final layer, where he would add final marks and details. The combination of all these innovations gave his work a unique and exciting appeal for his time. As one of his finishing touches, Titian was known to add nearly pure white strokes just prior to the final glaze. These were strategically placed whites. In this way, the highlight would be tinted by the glaze and blend into the piece, something we see to an even greater degree in the work of Rembrandt. A master who would come on the scene approximately a hundred years later and who is a great admirer of Titian's. Thank you.